unless you do the collision detection and response perfectly, in which case you're off the red. Right okay, so um, now in this lecture, yeah, we are going to start talking about the forces that you you compute in the external force slot of your rigid bodies to make sure that your bodies behave in an interesting way. Okay? Forces can come from engines, they can come from friction, they can come from, well, whatever shape your level has. Now, forces can be very complex, like the ones that you find in a car, or they can be very simple and just and, and very local, like the ones you find in, in bullets and other objects. Now, in this lecture, which is actually going to be also very, very short, we're talking about uh, gravity, friction, springs, centripetal force, not exactly a force like the other ones. Projectiles, and then I'll introduce the assignment. Now, of course, gravity is by far and large the easiest of all. Uh, gravity is computed by taking the masses of two objects, M1 and M2, multiplying by the gravitational constant G, which is conveniently repeated right next and dividing by the square of the distance between the two objects. All right? Now this force is just a number, obviously. In which direction does the force push? Seriously, guys, come on. In which direction does the force push? Left, center, center. The direction to in the direction the between the two centers of the mass. All right? Uh, now, uh, well, armed with the integrator from the first assignment and this formula, you could ideally build n bodies, which is rather typical uh, and very, very easy uh, implementation. So, for every pair of bodies, you can um, you could just apply this force and see the bodies that fold and move and have their complex dynamics happening. Now, one note uh, that we can do about n bodies is that you can use previous assignment to speed up n bodies very much. Because if you can group bodies in blocks of near body, of bodies which are near to, to each other, a whole group <coughs> can act as a single gravitational attractor for distant bodies. So instead of having to compute for every body the gravity, um, the gravity attractions with respect to all other bodies, you can do for every body the attraction from all the groups of bodies which are far and the single bodies which are close enough. This doesn't result in any loss of precision because, well, if you have two big planets there, they kind of attract like one, which can be computed as a weighted average of, of the other two. All right? So you can actually use the results of the previous assignment to speed up very greatly this kind of global interactions by grouping stuff together. Uh, of course, if you're working on the surface of a planet, then uh, force is simply uh, equal to m times a, where a is the local gravitational constant on the surface of the planet, where a is computed as, well, the missing term. So the gravitational constant times the mass of the planet divided by the squared radius of the planet because the radius is constant, and the mass of the, planet, the, of the second planet is constant, and so on. Uh, now, uh, another thing that's interesting is that gravity, even for a flight game, doesn't change that much. So gravity, even at a very high altitude, is going to be roughly constant. Uh, the International Space Station, for example, has a gravitational constant of approximately, does anyone know? 9.84. International Space Station. It's kind of high up. Something like 8.5. So most of gravity remains even in, in high orbit, right? So the gravity. So this thing on the surface of the planet kind of applies to very very high altitudes. Yep. Uh, what would be the curve compared to the altitude, for instance? Compared to the altitude. Well, the point is that R is already very very big and the gravitational constant and the mass are very, very big. So yeah, uh, it doesn't change that, that much. Uh, of course, it is a quadratic curve, so at some point, it is going to have a very steep decrease. But first, it, yeah. it remains, well, yeah. all, not, not almost constant, but well, close enough. So, well, I, I suppose you can already imagine 
how many things you can implement with something like this. All right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, a solar system can can actually be uh, a, decent, a decent version of this assignment. Uh, now, something else that happens very often, and which is very, very important for our perception of, real, of physical reality, is friction. Now, uh, friction is actually something that we give for granted, but without friction, stuff that slides too much feels absolutely wrong. Friction is, of course, related to the so-called normal force. But the normal force is, well, essentially the force in the... Uh, in the direction that's perpendicular to the surface that you're sliding over. So, for example, if I try to slide my pen across this table, now the, the amount of friction depends on what? On the vertical force against the table, right? On the other hand, if I try to slide, well, not the pen actually, um, yeah, this cheap battery, try to make it slide here, does it have any friction against the wall? Only when you push it against the wall. Only when you push it. But why doesn't it have any friction? Because it's in the same direction as the Because the, the only force that's, act, that's acting on the battery is gravity, right? And gravity goes down. 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 Okay. So when I push here, I'm actually applying another force, which is the force from my arm. And so now I'm causing friction. Because the force from my arm is perpendicular to the surface of sliding, right? But as soon as I give up this force, then the only force that's happening is gravity. And gravity is not perpendicular. It doesn't have any perpendicular component to the surface, right? Uh, you can have an intermediate scenario if you try to make the battery slide here, all right? So the friction, well, you can see that it stops early, earlier here. Because, well, gravity is pushing uh, a bit less in a perpendicular direction to the surface, all right? So the first thing you do when you want to compute how much friction you get is you compute how many of the current forces that are applied to the object are perpendicular to the surface of the object, all right? And usually you do that by taking the gravity. Well, in this case, for example, if we consider just the gravitational force, mg, how much of the gravitational force is actually normal to the surface. And if you know that the surface has an angle of theta with respect to the, to the, horizontal, uh, the, to the horizontal plane, then the force that's perpendicular to the object is mg cosine of theta. This is kind of intuitive, at least to me. Is, is, is this simple enough? All right. So uh, at this point, you take the normal force and you multiply by mu. And this is the amount of friction of the, this is the amount of friction force that you have against the body. Now what is mu? Well, mu is a constant that depends on the materials. So uh, if you have, I don't know, iron against iron, you will get some mu. If you have iron against wood, you'll have some other mu, and so on. Uh, so mu really depends on, uh, and, and you can easily, uh, you can just check the mu's that you have in the, there's plenty of tables of materials against materials and you just pick one in the range that makes sense and that you, that you kind of like. All right, now something that's unintuitive but very important is that you have two kinds of friction coefficients, which are the static friction coefficient and the dynamic friction coefficient. And surprising, well, of course the static friction coefficient applies to uh, two objects which are not moving, and dynamic friction coefficient applies to objects which are moving. Now, why? Well, how, how do we explain the fact that usually, or almost always, uh, the dynamic friction coefficient is smaller than the static one? Well, first of all, do you have any experience that relates to this? Have you ever experienced the, 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 the pleasures of furnishing a new home? <laughs> and you have to move something, like something really heavy. I don't know, uh, a sofa. You have to move a sofa, right? So the sofa is not moving by itself, of course. So you start pushing, and at first, damn, it's, it resists a lot, right? But then it gets moving, and as it moves, it's, it feels less heavy. Have you ever had this experience? Yeah. 
That's because you move from static friction into dynamic friction. And the dynamic friction is easier. So if you let the object stop, you have to push it moving again. All right? But if you keep it moving, it is actually going to do a little bit less. Of, uh, it's going to resist a little bit less. Uh, the reason for this is it's actually fascinating. Oh, yeah. hmm. Seriously, but have you ever seen someone do this correctly? Yeah. 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 Taking me to push it, uh, pull it further down. Harder, 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 faster. It's too fast and then, then let it go. Yeah. Oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was good. Oh, yes. Okay. All right. Da, da, da. It's a great victory for this course. So, uh, the reason why we have friction is that at a very small level, like you can imagine at the molecular level, a smooth surface is not smooth at all. Okay? And when you have two bodies moving one against each other, well, you do have like these little. Uh, bumps that go into each other, all right? This is actually the, 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 the tiny, very magnified and very artistically rendered surface of two objects which are sliding uh, against each other, all right? So when the objects are not moving, the, the two surfaces settle down on each other and they actually get into each other quite significantly, all right? But when the objects are moving, then you get some Bounces, the objects actually have tiny little bounces on top of each other. So these bounces mean that as you push, you push when the objects touch, but also as they bounce. And when they bounce, there's no friction. So what you get is the average of no contact. So you, you, you can imagine, can you imagine these tiny little bounces of the, the, these, these ragged surfaces on top of each other? And as you get these bounces, it's obviously easier to push. But when the objects are still, then to make them start moving, well, they, when they're still, they fall kind of into each other, and to make them move, you actually have to, uh, to, to really push them out of the lock, all right? So this is the reason why uh, you get, uh, why you, you actually experience the, 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 the stronger resistance when an object is, is standing still, all right? Now, what you can also do is you can also build something like Tilted plane simulator where you have a box and the box has static friction so it doesn't start moving unless you tilt the object too much. And if you tilt the object too much, uh, if you tilt the plane too much, then of course uh, the static friction is not going to be enough to keep the, 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 the object still. But if you apply some pressure, the object starts moving. All right? So you can build this kind of stuff. All right. Now, springs. Well, Springs are not exactly the hardest thing ever. Uh, you apply for, for reasonable springs, because this is not the perfect description of springs in general, but for reasonable springs that you do not extend too much, uh, we apply the so-called Hooke's law, which well, uses K, which is the stiffness of the spring, which is its resistance to, move, uh, resistance to movement, uh, multiplied by delta L, and this is the magnitude of the force that the spring applies to the object to go, yes. Isn't there uh, also damping in springs, or is that a level higher? Yeah, yeah, you... Oh yeah, damping springs. Yeah. Well, you can, you can consider damping as a form of friction mm -hmm. that you get on the force of the spring. Right. So you just handle that by friction instead of... You can try to handle that as friction, because right. actually damping is friction. It is the internal friction of the, the spring with itself. All right. Yeah. All right. Oh, and of course you do, you can play with these things. You you can put a box with a. Uh, did you do in high school the exercises box with a spring on the tilted plane? This kind of stuff. No. no. Lucky you. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, you, you can you can put all the combinations of these things you want. You can build a galactic spring that links together two planets and, I don't know, have a planet go through a nebula where you have some, some air resistance, whatever. So just play with these forces, put as many as you can. As you can see, they're easy. You just have to do with the, with the integrator. They just change the way the integrator works. All right. Uh, now, this is a stupid one. Okay. <laughs> now, something more interesting, of course, is bullets. 
and projectiles. Actually, we start with projectiles. Projectiles are anything you throw or you make move, all right? Now, of course, if you have gravity, then you get most of the typical motion on the projectile, right? So that is already that is already a good start. So having gravity helps. But there is plenty of stuff that also influences the motion of the projectile. Uh, you have aerodynamic drag, which is the air resistance of the projectile. Uh, you have the so-called uh, laminar and turbulent flow, which are two kinds of applications of um, aerodynamic drag. But you have to realize that aerodynamic drag changes dramatically during the flight of, of an object. So a fast object has a kind of, flow, uh, of, of, of drag, and a slow object has a completely different kind of aerodynamic drag. So as an object slows down, the resistance of air actually changes dramatically. So if you want to have a simulation that's accurate, uh, and if you want to do something like golf balls, then yeah, for golf balls, all these are actually very important to, to have a decent simulation. Uh, then of course you have the wind, which changes the aerodynamic drag. And this is actually something super intuitive that no one ever really thinks about when doing physics. Uh, the effect of spin. A ball, okay, okay, this is a room full of nerds, so maybe not all of you have played with lots of balls when you were kids. But, who has? Alright, oh, seriously, people do not raise their hands, so... Uh, but, uh, when, you, when you throw a ball that's rotating very, very fast, the ball changes its direction of path. It goes down faster or it stays up longer, just depending on the rotation, alright? And this is, uh, well, this is due to, to, to an effect which is called the Magnuson effect, which we will actually see. So if you have a, and depending, in, especially in golf games, on the choice of iron that you make, then you will cause a different rotation, a different initial rotation. Yeah. Uh, Firstly, for instance. Let me think. Yeah. Yeah. For the frisbee, absolutely. Oh yeah, yeah, the the, the planner, uh, the, the planner motion of the frisbee. Yeah. I, I was more thinking like a, a a volleyball ball that you that you yeah. force a strong rotation towards. But yeah, of course. And that is that's what gives the the, 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 the horizontal uh, the horizontal rotation. Yeah. Uh, actually, you know, there was a, a ship that was built uh, at the beginning of of last century with only a gigantic cylinder rotating on the mast. Not kidding. And the ship moved forward. It, it was did. slow. It was, it was way too slow, yeah. <laughs> it was a fascinating idea. And then of course, yeah, uh, and, and the last one is very obvious. Uh, the geometry and the mass of the projectile uh, influence everything. So first of all, aerodynamic drag. Now this is the formula that you usually find for uh, aerodynamic drag. So how much the air, and the, the impact between the object and the air molecules is going to influence the movement of your object, all right? Of course, these are these are all forces, so then you have to apply them as forces. So you have a projectile which is very small but has very high mass, then the force is of course going to uh, act less on its velocity. So uh, the force that you apply is one half multiplied by your rho, multiplied by v squared, which is the velocity of the body of force, multiplied by A, which is the body air, the, the area of the body which is subject to the, 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 the frontal area of the body, multiplied by C D, which is the drag coefficient. Alright? So th this is once again very simple. A is a constant for your rigid body, because your body is rigid, so it doesn't change shape mid-flight. But this formula is a lie. And now we'll, we'll see exactly why. So, uh, oh, first of all, naturally, you apply this force in what direction? Against the direction of the uh, against the direction of the velocity, obviously. So you multiply, uh, you multiply F V by minus V divided by length of it. So minus the normalized velocity, which is the the the, 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 the yeah. So the area also be the, uh, the area also be the projected area in the direction. Oh, if you really want to be classy, yes, naturally. Okay. Yeah. If you have a complex object that's moving very fast, if you like shoot a car with a very strong cannon, then of course the motion, the, 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 the rotation, the current facing direction is actually going to change very much. Yeah. So when the car rotates against, then air resistance is going to be significantly stronger, but as rotation continues, when the car is facing horizontally, then you'll see a bit of acceleration and so on. So you see a very complex motion. Yes. And so, oh, here's a fun question. Imagine you have a working SAT system and you want to compute 
the area, the forward facing area of an object with an SAT system. I want an answer, I'm going to get confused. <laughs> Seriously, I'm not going to answer this. Try to put these things together. Uh, why? Because <coughs> SAT has a component, there's a component of SAT which is fundamental for a huge amount of geometrical reasoning, especially the, com the an approximate computation of the area. See you in a couple of minutes. Well, think hard. Um. I can't this <laughs> Das <laughs> 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 Does anyone have an answer? Yes. Oh, I forgot to mention, I'm actually going to give you uh, half a point if the answer is correct. Oh, cool. In final action. Ah. I was thinking if you uh, get the uh, minimum values of uh, the four minimum values, then you actually have the closest values and then you can make a surface of it. I was thinking about that. Okay, and then you can this again. Uh, for instance, you have a plane and um, in the direction where it's going, then you project it, and then you get the minimum, minimum values of, um, of the object that is traveling. In the direction where in the direction of travel. Yeah. But what, what do we want for the plane? We're getting very close. But what do we want? So let's go back to the previous formula. We want the area. But this area is the area that's perpendicular in the direction of motion. Yep. Could you just project, project the minimum and maximum onto the direction and then in between that is the area? Nope. Because that is the area. The, that, that is in the direction of motion, what you want, the area, has to be perpendicular to that. Yep. How do you take uh, an amount of axis perpendicular to the uh, four direction? Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess that is a separating axis. Mm -hmm. And then you get a minimum and maximum. Yes. And well, the amount of axis that you take, the more refined the area. But for the area, let's say we want to approximate the area with a rectangle, right? You take one half and one across the Exactly. You take the normal and the uh, sorry, the normal and the binormal directions with respect to the tangent, and you get the extents, the horizontal and the vertical extent against the, 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 the direction of motion, and that gives you an approximate area. Right? First you'll need to do this in real time, you can pre you can pre-process this. But what this means is that you have a very powerful source of information that comes from the computer interval thing. All right? Sorry, you got very close, but it actually reminded me because I had to write down this, you get half point uh, over 10. All right? So, very good. Now, uh, so we know how to compute, hello, uh, we know how to compute now. The area, even dynamically, we know how to compute 
the, 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 the whole uh, the whole dynamic fri the, the whole uh, the friction. But the problem is that the drag coefficient cannot be reliably estimated by just one number. The coefficient of drag depends heavily on well, okay, the shape of the project, or of the project <coughs> obviously, but also on a bunch of other stuff. It depends on the velocity. It depends on the air resistance. Yes. It depends on lots and lots of things. So, what we do is to, to determine the actual drag coefficient that you apply in the previous formula, you need to first compute an auxiliary quantity which is called the Reynolds number, which is usually indicated with RE. And then some function, which is usually very complex, so we approximate that very brutally, uh, gives you the actual coefficient of friction. So, the Reynolds number is Rho multiplied by the velocity multiplied by the length of the projectile, which we can compute how? By the minimum and maximum. Along with the direction of travel, yes. Uh, divided by uh, the drag coefficient of the material of the projectile against, uh, against air or whatever medium the projectile is traveling in, into. Okay? So now we just have to find out how do we compute the coefficient, so how, uh, what's the shape of the function f? So given the Reynolds number, and it's kind of obvious, you can compute this, you have all this data, you have rho, you have mu, you have b, you have l. Uh, now you want to compute cd. Oh, yeah, it's an important note. So usually, what we do is at around a random number of 250,000, you, you can have these weird, super weird uh, functions, but usually for a project traveling through air at decently high speeds, then yeah, a Reynolds number of 250,000. Uh, you have a switch from uh, oh yeah, turbulent flow into laminar flow. And so you have just two coefficients of friction. All right? So you just store two CD numbers for every projectile. And when the Reynolds number goes below 250,000, then you use the smallest, otherwise you use the bigger. All right? The biggest. One thing to note, though, is that indeed air density does change dramatically with altitude. So, whereas um, gravity remains kind of the same, so for a plane simulator, gravity, uh, the changes of gravity are not a significant factor. For a flight simulator, the changes in air density are a very significant factor. Right? So, air density ch uh, goes down like crazy uh, already, uh, I think. But I am inventing stuff. I think that already at a few kilometers the air density is halved, right? Or even less. Okay. So, the final one that we get is, well, not really the final, but almost. Uh, one of the last one, uh, points that we get is wind. Now, what happens to air resistance if you have wind? is against you? Is air resistance higher or lower? Higher. What if it's behind you, pushing? Obviously. Yeah, come on, everyone here cycles uh, against the wind or in the Netherlands. <laughs> so you, you kind of know the, the, the experience, yes? <coughs> Does that actually have influence of the, on, on, the, um, on the density of the air itself? Or is it just because no. you're getting a force in one direction or the other? So the idea is that the resistance that air does against you depends on the relative motion of air. So if all air is moving with you, then you are encountering less air resistance. So what you do is simply you take the relative air velocity, so you have your own motion of uh, your own velocity, uh, then you have the velocity of the wind, and you get your own apparent velocity, which is your velocity minus the velocity of the wind. And if the wind is going in uh, against you, then your apparent velocity is going to be bigger. If the wind is going with you, then uh, the velocity is going to be, uh, your, your, your uh, apparent velocity is going to be smaller. And then you use these as the V in the, the air resistance equation. Quite simple. Okay. Now, uh, at this point when an object is spinning, you also get an additional effect. This effect, known as the Magnus effect or the Robbins effect, causes a significant acceleration perpendicular to both the axis of rotation and the velocity of motion. Now for this one I actually have to draw, but now 
I know I do. I know. I just have to push. Um, okay. Now, imagine you have a ball going in this direction and rotating backwards. Right? Where do you, first of all, where do you expect the force is going to is going to go? Vertical direction, horizontal direction? The, the rotation, where does it push the ball towards? Okay, you say up or vertical direction? Um, vertical direction. Just let, let's start with vertical direction, then then we go with up and down, right? So in general, what you get is that you take the axis of rotation and the direction of velocity and you use the right-handed rule to determine in what direction the force is going to be applied towards. Or if you want, you just do the cross product between the velocity of motion and uh, the axis of rotation. Then the reason why this happens is that, well, so in this direction, imagine a single particle here, okay? And its relationship with the molecules of air that it's going to hurt against. So you can imagine the molecules of air, you actually hit against them. Just like very, very tiny ping pong balls or whatever. So you actually hit them and, and yeah, they have mass. They, they, they are molecules. Just because they're air doesn't mean that they're any less physical than everything else. Okay? So you will hit, as you move, a bunch of air molecules, all right? But the upper surface, how many molecules is it going to hit? Well, it depends on the velocity, but also on the rotational velocity. So this rotational velocity here goes in this direction, right? So on the upward side, the upper side of the ball or of the object has a faster velocity, uh, actual velocity in the, in the direction of motion. Because the rotation makes the upper surface go towards the direction of motion, right? Is this clear? Who doesn't understand this? No, come on, just. All right, so. I'll try again from scratch. So, no, no, no. so this is the, the. This is our ball moving, all right? Now, if the ball is not rotating, then this spot here and this spot here. They hit the same number of air molecules, right? In a given amount of time, say in one in one hundredth of a second. Alright? Now, if the ball is rotating in this direction, then the rotation causes this particle to, the, this spot to move in this direction, but this other spot to move in this direction, right? It's the point of rotation. So the final actual velocity of this point here, of the upper surface, is going to be the part of the, the velocity coming from the rotation plus the velocity coming from the movement because the whole movement the ball is moving. Yes? So it's actually it's a kind of relative velocity. It's a relative velocity, the, the very different relative velocity across the parts of the surface of the object. Yes. Exactly. But, yeah. but since it's a ball, once it rotated a little bit, it will just have two new top and uh, bottom points. Yeah, but those new tops and bottoms keep hitting. So at the top, exactly, at the top you always get higher pressure because you hit more particles. So the top hits more particles because the whole top is going faster. So whereas the bottom hits less particles and with less force. Right. So the bottom has less pressure. So you should actually not think about rotation at that point. You don't think about the rotation. You think about the fact that with rotation, this part here is going in this direction. This part here is going at this, uh, in this, uh, at this, sorry, at this velocity. So the bottom is actually going at an apparent velocity which is lower. Right. And if the rotation is, uh, is fast, then you have a significantly faster rotation on the top. Or of course, if the rotation is in the other way, then, then, then you get the opposite. What this results in is that you, it's like constantly hitting the top of the ball faster. And so the ball, if hit from the top, is going to go towards. Towards. In a downward direction. All right. Of course, uh, if so, what this happens is that if uh, a golf ball or a car that you shoot is rotating very fast, 
in the upward direction is going to fly much higher. So instead of getting, so the, the curves of motion you have are something like this, without air friction, so just with gravity. Uh, with air friction, it's going to be much shorter, because air friction at some point stops the motion. But with, the, uh, with this effect, you can even get something like this. Or, and this is with an upward spin, uh, or you can get something that falls very quickly with a downward spin. All right? So these are the kinds of motion that you get. And yes, they are significant. So if you have uh, the concept, if, if you have, you ever build a game where the concept of, uh, concept of throwing stuff uh, that rotates, indeed, yeah, golf is, is obviously, or sports games are the most obvious example, but not the only one, then yeah, this is absolutely fundamental. All right? If you just have regular stuff that you throw, then you can probably just get away with air friction. Oh, oh, wait a second, yeah. Uh, this thing about the difference in pressure is actually the thing that keeps planes going up. Because with planes, well, the wing is kept orientated upwards. So if the plane is moving in this direction, then the surface of the, of the wing is going to be something like this. You do, have you ever noticed that a plane doesn't fly level, it flies a bit up? Alright. So, what happens is that, so with gravi gravity plus the direction of motion means that the wing, the lower part of the wing, is going to hit far more molecules of air than the upper part. The upper part barely hits anything, so every molecule that you hit pushes the wing upwards. And this is the reason why uh, planes stay in the air. Which is kind of awesome. So you have to imagine, uh, if there is all the, next time you're on the plane, think about this. The fact that your wings are constantly hitting like tiny ping pong balls, molecules of air, the, the molecules of air bounce away from the wing, and the wing bounces a little bit away from the molecule. Okay? So you could ideally make a plane fly in space against ping pong balls, actual ping pong balls. <laughs> Isn't the curve of the uh, wing more uh, not more influence in the curve of all of the uh, so the curve uh, there's different between the curve of the lower part of the wing and the upper parts. Yeah, that has more influence in being concave than the. No, that has influence. So the, the actual shape of the, the wing has lots of influence. Obviously, that's the reason why you see wings with, with very weird shapes. But and also to, to yeah to give more stability to the plane, etc. But remember that the first plane had wings like this. And it flew. Not very much, but it did fly. So the, the most important part is that uh, if you put the engine, if the engine is pushing a bit upwards, so not just forward, but upwards, so you tilt the plane somehow, then that is going to make even a, a crappy wing, which is just flat, it is still going to, 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 to make the, the, the wing work as you would like. Right? Okay. No. No. <laughs> no. Okay. All right. No. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. It's, it's fine. Now. Don't don't touch it. Don't touch it. <laughs> okay. So uh, now. Actually work, but. Um, okay, so what, how do we actually compute something like the Magnuson force? Well, first of all, you take the direction of the force, which is the cross product between the velocity and the axis of, angular, uh, the axis of rotation. Normalize, obviously, because this is just the direction of the force. And then you get the usual equation for air resistance, but this is in the perpendicular direction, so this is not air resistant. Resistance multiplied by a constant which comes from, uh, by, sorry, a value which is not a constant, which comes from the shape of the object. So in this case, we just consider a sphere where we have the radius of the sphere multiplied by omega divided by v. Uh, of course, we're talking about the, um, the magnitudes here, so the, the magnitude of omega and the magnitude of v. Uh, and for a cylinder, you have 2 pi multiplied by r, rw divided by v. Okay? And you just take the magnitudes of the velocities. 
All right. So, uh, when you're shooting stuff, on the other hand, the projectiles are built for stability. And if projectiles are built for stability, then this means that, well, one of the effects that projectile and gun manufacturers try to minimize as possible is the Magnuson effect. Because that would push your projectile upwards or downwards, which is kind of something that makes aiming hard. Uh, so so what's, what they try to do is they give a rotation to the projectile along the direction of motion. So this means that rotation is controlled and the magnetism force between the, the axis of rotation, which is forward, and the axis of motion, which is still forward, gives you an almost zero gross product. So what really happens is that you don't get any magnetism effect because it changes almost nothing. Yep? Is it called Magnus because of the uh, gun that has uh, his barrel uh, in a spiral way? So when you shoot out a bullet, that uh, bullet is... Well, no, the, 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 the fact is called Magnuson effect. Magnus effect? Because it was discovered by a guy who was called Magnus. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, the, the spirals inside the barrel of the gun are the thing that causes the, 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 the forward, uh, the, the forward uh, axis of rotation. Uh, and so for bullets, you can actually ignore very safely the Magnus effect completely, all right? No, yeah. Oh, yeah, this is just a piece of advice. So when you're looking for the constants of um, the constants of air resistance, they should be in this range, 0 0.3, so 1 point uh, right to the, sorry, one, um, one digit right to the, uh, to the point. Okay. Whereas, for example, for friction coefficients, you will get something smaller, like 0 0.01. Just learn how to spot reasonable coefficients, but you then have to play with them to get the most pleasant results. So yeah, the, the last example is a cannonball. A cannonball can be very effectively uh, simulated. So just not to talk about golf balls, a cannonball suffers all of these things. It suffers from gravity, it suffers from the Magnus effect, it suffers from my resistance. Uh, yeah, and that's it actually. Oh, and it suffers from air friction, obviously. All right. And then you can do kind of all sorts of stuff. If you manage to get everything working with whole simulator, uh, you could arguably try to build a brick wall, which is stable thanks to the collision response, against the cannon wall. If you manage to do that, I will give you a 10. I don't care. For everything? For the, the whole course, you will get a 10 if you manage to have a brick wall which you can shoot and where the bricks fall with a, with a collision detection response that we saw. This <laughs> unofficial binding promise now. Alright, so this gives us the, the assignment. You can wait until you see cars. If you're really passionate about cars and racing games, then do not do this, do the next one. But this one is alternative to what you will see next week. All right. So either you do cars, or you do projectiles and uh, or, and bodies, whatever. All right. Yep. Yeah, of course, you can do both. Cars and yeah. bullets. Yeah. Can do a car that shoots. Uh, that is, you shoot a car with a, with a cannon. A, a car that is running towards a brick wall, and you have to shoot it with a cannon. And you win if you shoot it away from the brick wall. Absolutely. All right. So this is it. This was a very, this was a very easy and simple lecture, um, and now we go on to a working class.